Hi there guys and welcome to Vox Cine Academy's video podcast number 35 and today we have a very special guest at my Danny Long studio because he's coming for a lesson here. We're going to have a lesson after this video podcast and we have the lead singer from Thornhill, Jacob Charlton in the studio. Thanks for joining us today. Jake, I really appreciate it, dude. Thanks for having me. What's been happening? Well, let me give you a bit of a wind up firstly. Your band, Thornhill, 2016 released the 13 EP. 2017, you were unearthed Triple J, uh, you won a category in that, where we were trying to work out what it was before this. You also, oh, 2018, you released the, the Butterfly EP. And then this year, the Dark Pool album, your first album has come out through Unified. And you had your first single, which was? It was Coven. Coven? Yeah. And then Nurture, yeah. which was which is which I've heard on Triple J a lot, high rotation. Yeah. And your latest single, Where We Go When We Die, has been released as well too. Richard Kingsmill, who is the uh, radio, um, he's probably the uh, head honchos, the head honchos there. He he reviewed Nurture and he absolutely loved it as well. So I read his read his review in um, Unearthed section. You have supported names like North Lane, one of our boys here, North Lane, The Architects, Polaris, Parkway Drive, In Hearts Wake, another one of my boys, Bear Tooth, Make Them Suffer. Um, you also played- uh, Just did Enter Shikari. Enter Shikari, you played the Heaven and Hell Festival. You played the Unified Festival last year as well too. We have just been doing some shows nationally around Australia in support of the Dark Pool album. You're heading over to Europe early next year in support of that as well too. Then back here to play Download Festival, where I'm gonna get the, the download on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're gonna to be touring again nationally around Australia and then possibly world domination after that. <laughs> That's the plan. Fantastic. All right, so mate, look, it's it's been it's been a massive year for you, um, and and Thornhill as well too. The critically acclaimed albums come out. You've had great res response to that, the fans and 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 the the the, the reviewers have given a great reviews. What I've read everywhere, the magazines. Uh, so you've got great reviews everywhere. Give us a little bit of a chronological run through of your artistic life so far like when did it start give us a run through of when it all sort of started well um i think my parents could tell that i was okay at music from a very early age i started piano when i was four um and from there all i did was pester them to play drums and they wouldn't let me um until i learned the piano properly so i had been smashing through that i joined the australian boys choir when i was maybe eight years old um, and I kept doing that until I kind of got, you know, I kind of got let go because my voice broke. Yeah. Um, and then I. How old was that? How old were you? Man, I was probably like fourteen or fifteen because I was really late to for my voice to break. Um, yeah. And so I stopped doing that and I stopped singing altogether and I kind of focused more on drums. Played drums at school a lot. Played in drums in bands. Then I went from playing drums to playing bass in bands. Then I went from playing bass to playing guitar in bands. And um, at my school, in a lot of the Battle of the Band stuff, um, there was no singers. And I was like, oh, you know, I could, I could give this a crack. I could have a, have a go. And I was absolutely terrible. It's the same, same at our school as well. So we had no singers. No singers, man. But like, I go, I go there now and there's heaps. It's in now because of all the, yeah. all the competitions and the, um, the, the, the on, on TV, it's all about yeah, the TV exactly. show. So everyone wants to do it now. Yeah, so, but I was also the only kid that was screaming, really, at the time as well. Yeah. Um, by screaming, I mean just yelling really loud. Yeah. And seeing how that, you know, how that worked out. Um, and so we did that, and I kind of got a little bit better, because I kind of got more confident. And, and we did that, and then we just decided, um, the people who I was playing in Battle of the Bands with, we decided to make a band. So we left school, and with that same amount of vocal knowledge, we wrote 13 and recorded 13 and Butterfly. Wow. So I didn't come to you till after Butterfly. Yes. So yeah, you can definitely tell. We <laughs> did though, we did pre-prog on some Butterfly yeah, songs. Yeah, we did, but though. they already recorded. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Because I remember, I remember, you know, um, going through how to do them live. Yes. Right. Yes. I, rem I de yeah. definitely remember doing that. Wow. So it's been a, a very, a very. It's been a long process then. So it hasn't it's been, been a, a bumpy ride. It hasn't been a, an overnight process. Like a lot of people think. Oh, you know, everyone, you know, Thornhill just broken. But you know, you've been doing it since you were four. So you know, mo all of your life, you've been basically singing. I think my parents knew that that's all I could do. <laughs> I don't really have that much talent anywhere else. Music's all I got, really. I can't work a nine to five. I just can't do it. And, and you got to follow. You got to do what you enjoy. You have to. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point. And, and, as well, too. Uh, are you still working at the pizza shop? Yeah, I am. Part time. Um. Yeah, part time. But I think they're kicking me out after Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. All right. Fantastic. That's uh, that's really good. Mate, we're going to get stuck into some questions um, here, first and foremost. One question that I wanted to sort of start off with, though, before we get into, the, there's, uh, the, we had quite a few questions that were, were sent, were inboxed to me, and I just picked out, I think, maybe the five or six most relevant ones, and then I've gone into some more sort of personal stuff towards you, and if we have enough time. How did you... How, what was the process about you being signed or getting signed for Unified? Did they approach you or did you approach them? Um, they actually scouted us at one of our shows. So they, I'm guessing they go around to a couple of different local shows just to, to see, you know, either what the hype is about the band or just to see if there's anyone they want to add to their roster. And they came to one of our shows and we met them and we talked with them and you know, we were, we were stoked, we were very happy, but it wasn't until a lot later that we got a actual, you know, offer and a contract for, I think it was before we'd even released Butterfly, so it was straight off Tempera and, or Limo. Yeah, and so, they, they were singles as well too. Yeah, yeah, they're just standalone, two standalone. They were two, two standalone singles, if you, if you don't know about, about those that were, they were in between. 13 and Butterfly. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's a little stepping stone, pretty much. Now, with that as well too, did you have any offers from, did you send your uh, 13 and Butterfly uh, EP to any other record companies? Did you shop it around to any other, or, or did you send it to um, Unified, or did they actually, they, did they, they sourced you out? I think we sent Temper and Limbo around a yep. bit because we hadn't actually got Butterfly, so we actually got the offer before we'd written Butterfly, which was cool. So um, I think for Temper and Limbo, yeah, we shopped him around a little bit, but we were, you know, extremely stoked with UNFT. So. With Unified, how come they didn't release Butterfly? They did. They yeah. did. Yeah, we did Butterfly through UNFT. Get yeah. As our first EP. label release. Yeah. Okay, alrighty. Now with with the the Dark Pool album and even the Butterfly album, did. An AR guy person overlook the songs and say, yep, yeah, these are going to make it and these aren't? Or did you have artistic control over, over everything that was released on, on the, the EP and the albums? Artistic control. Why? They were very stoked with everything we gave them. Like, we, we didn't give them stuff too early because with music, you know, you never know where a song's going to be until you think it's finished. Yep. You can't just give them demos and be like, no, this is five minutes about five seconds of like what I think this song's gonna be, or this is a chorus, or this yep. is that. We were like, you know, we'll send it when we're ready to send what we have. Yep. And when we did, their, their feedback was amazing. You know, they were very happy, they were very supportive, and so, you know, it's the best thing you can ask for with a big label. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So really, the, the hype from, from you guys playing live out there pretty much attracted Unified to you. Yeah, which is weird, because we were so bad. But I know that people were, were in the in the industry and other bands were talking about you because you were different, but kind of had some elements of some of the bands as well. To that, they that they've got like I think some of your guitar sound sounds like earlier uh, North Lane stuff. Um, so I think you've got elements, but I think you've also got something very different to what all the other bands that they've got on there do, especially with your vocal presentation where you nearly have that um, uh, that ambient kind of singing, nearly to the point of, nearly at points choir. Yeah, you felt that choral influence. Like, and do you think that you have got that influence from being in the Australian Boys Choir? Because no one does what you do there. That's, that's a very unique 
nearly it's nearly at the times it's you got this heavy music but then you got this nearly light ambient music of vocal melodies going over the top and then you always you have the harder things and 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 i think things have progressed and we're going to go into some of your vocal different different techniques and colors mm. um i think we found that out mostly it's like that because i can't really do half cleans you know i can't really do the um dirty cleans that we've tried to do for months like, i just can't do them so i think i think you've got some stuff on. i have a little a little bit like butterfly that but that was just me yelling singing remember because i didn't know how to sing so i was just like oh do you if you want to get high do you push really hard and for me doing that it just made my vocal cords just like smack so hard that it was distorted but like i think a lot of it yeah i reckon probably quite influenced for yep. sure yeah yeah we're gonna we're gonna go because there, there is actually a question regarding that as well too. So um, now let's just get into some questions there. So thank you for that. That was that was really insightful. What is your pre and post gig vocal preparation and or routine? Okay, so right now I'm still playing around, you know, because you still gotta find what you like. I do about three ums. Yep. I do two... For those of you that don't know what an ung is, an ung is we block off the back of the uve. It's a professional warm exercise. Um, yep, so you do three sets of ung. So three of those. I do two of the wee falsettos. Yep. Um, and then I start doing some cries. Um, and I do the art scale. Yep. And then I'm done. I'm ready to go. Maybe a couple of... What about some... Would you do any harder stuff for your harder voice? No, not really. I never, never feel like I need to. I, I do a bit before, like if I'm side of stage, yeah. I'll start doing the sounds, start building up the sounds. Like I do a little bit bef like on side of stage because I still got to set up my equipment, got to do that. So I do my like 20 minute, 25 minute warm up. Then I go set up my stage, uh, set up my stuff. And while I'm setting up, I do a bit of the huskier screams or a bit, you know, a couple of ums while I'm going and stuff like that, just to keep myself warmed up. And then I get off stage and I do, Maybe one or two arms and I'm to cool down. Yeah, yep. Now, well, do you start warming up like a half an hour before you get up on on stage? About that. Yeah. yeah. About that. Okay. Depending Fantastic. depending on how it's like it all depends on the, the time slot or like where you are on the bill. If you're main support or you're headline, you've got so much time. But if you're an opener, you, you don't have any time because you just you just did a little warm up for your sound check and now you have to warm down and then warm up again and then sing and then warm down. It's like like that so you have to you have to change for what you are yep. in the bill yep just just taking it back a little bit further than that um for instance if you have if you're going to get on at nine o'clock being the main support for instance mm -hmm. what would your day routine be like your lunch do you get up later what do you eat do you have something more to eat at lunchtime and not anything to eat before the show and then you do it do you eat after the show and I think no matter what I always eat after. Yeah. Even or if I'm main if I'm main support or opening, I never eat before a show. So not even during the day? Oh yeah I do. Like breakfast and lunch is fine. As long as it's what, four hours before you play. Well as long as you feel good. Like, yeah. You'll know in yourself. But I always eat afterward unless I'm um, unless I am the headline. Because yeah. you can you can eat an early dinner and you'll be fine. Yeah. Because you're not on until 10 or 11 o'clock at night, so yep. you can normally get away with it. But yeah, I, I kind of treat the day not as normal, you know, because yep. as soon as you start changing things too drastically, you start getting stressed and nervous. Nervous, yeah. For me personally, like, so I just go about my day the normal way and I just don't eat dinner. Yep, yep. Um, and you're drinking water during the day? Yep, water only, really, water. Yep. Or a bit of Powerade, because on tour you can get pretty tired and dead, so. Yep. Yeah, um, getting to the venue. If you were going to be a head, uh, the headliner or the main support, how how what how how early would you get to the, to the venue before your show? If you're going to get on at nine, for instance. Well, you got to you got to get in for load in. So whatever time the venue lets you in. So it's normally like load in would be like two to four. Yep. And then if you're headlining, you're the you get first sound check. So you sound check for however long. Or if you're opening. You know, you watch the headline band sound check at like four or five, and then you sound check from six to seven, and then doors are at eight, and then you play at eight thirty kind of thing. So yeah. it just depends on the venue. 
Yeah. So it's an all, all day thing, basically. Yeah, pretty much. If you're going to play a show, it's most of the day. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, what was your pre recording for the new album, vocal preparation, before recording and pre production of the songs? Did you do anything differently or special on the new Dark Pool album than what you did on the Butterfly EP or the 13 EP to do with pre-production or uh, pre-recording? I think so. I think in a good way and a bad way because we self-produced. Um, all the vocals were actually done in my friend's house who plays bass, Cage. Oh, on, on even the, the Dark Pool album? Yeah, on the whole Dark We self-produced the whole thing. Oh, wow. So in just a bedroom, really. So we, uh, um, if I was going to record vocals, I'd either have no time to warm up or I'd have the whole day to warm up. Like if I had an idea while we were in there, I'd say, you know, plug in the mic, let's do it now. I'd do a trill or not even and I'd just start singing. But because of my new singing techniques, like having no warm up with that sort of stuff wasn't too bad. It was fine. I could go for a longer period of time. But if I wanted to really, really do a big session, like a big vocal day, I would warm up the same as I would for a show. Yep. And then make sure I'd warm down so I could do it the next day. But we never really had the same schedule we had with Butterfly. That Butterfly you have, if you go to someone else to record, you have four or five days of guitars, you have three of drums, and you have three or four of singing. And so you have to take care of yourself for those four days. But for when we recorded um, Paul, we didn't really have that. It was just like whenever I had something, I'd go record it. Which I think is good, I think it's because cool. you can get into the groove of that one song. When you're banking up, you got two or three days to do your vocals. You got to do all the songs in one sort of nearly run, basically exactly. over a couple exactly. of days. So. Which means that some aren't going to sound the way you want it compared to others. Yeah, because your voice is naturally going to get tired. Yeah, which means you're naturally going to sound tired. Yeah, which is like, nah. yeah. I think it was definitely cool. It'd be cool to space vocal days out, you know, and have one day here drums. Vocals, guitar, vocals kind of thing, but that's not really how it works. <laughs> yeah. I know Dead Letter Circus did that on one of their, their albums, I think the Catalyst Fire album. True. Um, I think they, they did each track uh, individually uh, with Forrester at, uh, at Sing Sing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. You use a variety of different vocal tones and singing techniques such as clean, husky, screaming, extremely high clean singing and falsetto. What inspired your, what is your inspiration and influence to use all these different vocal uh, ranges and textures? Because I, I do see that it has changed a little bit over the, e, uh, over the course of the EPs, because I think the first, the 13 EP, you were even doing some nearly, nearly like death metal. Oh. Yeah, stuff yeah. on that, which you don't really do that anymore, no. and you're doing, I suppose, a little bit more cleaner stuff now, a bit more sort of um, harder stuff as well too. But uh, especially with the um, the nurture single, where you're going in and out of falsetto um, amazingly well, which is sort of a thing that's not in many of your other songs, but I think no. it's a great hook. It's very hard. And I think it's, I think it's the, this personally, it's my favorite song of, 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 of yours. Um, on, I, I had a quick look on Spotify, just let's go back to that. What, what's your most, do you know what your most played song is on Spotify? I went to have a look at that last night and then I went, what am I on Spotify for? I think Reptile. Is it? Reptile is like over a million or something like that. Which is off the 13. No, it's off Spotify. Uh, yes, it is off Butterfly. Sorry. Yes, and then is. I need to be Coven, I'd say, because Coven was released a while ago. But yep. Where We Go is the most played so far, like, yep. for the time period. Yep, yep, which is a new single, guys. Check it out. It's fantastic. Um, all these three song tracks are fantastic. The, the, whole, the whole album is really, really great as well, too. So, The instrumental track. Never plays? Yes. Yeah, I played that on piano. So that was your that was your inspiration. It's something very different to, mm. to to everything else that's on the on the album. Yeah, I think we really wanted something like that because um, I don't know, it just separates the songs. Like it's, 
I don't like having too many like instrumental or just like nothing tracks on an album. I feel like everything needs to fit, everything needs to mean something. But for this one, I was just like, it needs, we needed a big intro for where we go. Because the last song, you know, it means the most to us. This is an instrumental track that we're talking about as well too, guys, if, if you don't know. Do you use that track live? We might. We haven't so far, but I'd love to play around with something like that. Fun. I was even thinking having it as as an intro mm, before you guys cool. get up on stage. Yeah, having where we go as the first song. Yeah, that'd be cool. That's my thing. Okay, sorry. Ah, let's go back to the question there. So you use a variety of different vocal tones and techniques, clean, husky, screaming, extremely high falsetto. What inspired and influenced you to use these different vocal ranges? I think what inspired me was learning how to do them, you know, yeah. more than anything. I mean, because... For Butterfly and for 13, I was kind of just doing what I thought I could do. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, if I can do it, I'll do it. You know, I just made melodies that are a bit too high and a bit too hard, and I was just playing around. But for Dark Pool, I kind of zoned in on what I can do, and I looked at my ability, and I'm just like, if I can, you know, there's, there's smarter ways to get to these and to do these things. And so when I made melodies, I was like, okay, these are very high notes, and these are big jumps but I can do it in a smarter way and use my falsetto or use my mixed voice for a whole section if I need to because I don't need the power. I think it was just, yeah, it was definitely the inspiration was being able to understand my voice now and being yep. able to know what I can do. Yep. Which was, you know, the hard, that's the hardest part of learning, isn't it, with your voice. With the Butterfly, I remember working on the Butterfly EP with you and some of the stuff was excruciatingly high in true voice. It's like... You know, we're going around C's and D's and stuff like that, and even higher. I think it was a D sharp there that we did in in, in mixed voice. We ended up going up there in mixed voice. Yeah. But I, know I don't even we've... know what mixed voice was at that point. Yeah, mixed mixed voice is is a is a, a mixture between true voice and falsetto. For those of you that don't know that, and Jacob uses this a lot in his high range. A lot. Um, Sting from Police and probably Giddy Lee from Russia too. Really, um, they use it quite a lot. Uh, when when they were when they were singing as well too for those of you who are a little bit older if not Google those those two bands there uh, especially Rush they're amazing okay fantastic what I've you nearly answered this question uh, earlier as well too again this is a question from uh, from a fan here what made you want to get into music and singing so you pretty much gave us a run through at the start there so mm. that did, did that pretty much answer that there yeah that, my parents played a lot as well, like around the house and I just... Played music? Yeah. Yeah, well, what did your parents play? My parents played, well my dad always played Pink Floyd, yeah. like constantly, and my mum always played Jeff Buckley. Yeah. And I, he's like one of my biggest influences as yeah. a vocalist, so... Yeah, amazing. I, he's so good, like so good. Did your mum ever play Tim Buck Buckley, his dad? No. no. Is he good? I've never listened to him. Check him out. Check out uh, Postcards from uh, LA. Check that one out. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Crazy voice. Crazy voice, so it runs in the family. Yes, crazy vibrato. I'd like to get your opinion on his vibrato. Yeah. Nearly goat-like, but um, yeah, very, very good, very talented. So, yeah. fantastic. Okay. You spoke a little bit about this before, that you warm up and then you go and check out your vocal rig. Um, what does your live vocal rig setup consist of? Mm, all right, so this has changed a lot. Um, and we kind of finalized it at, on this pool tour uh, that we just did because my um, custom molds got smashed on the fly. Um, so we figured it out. Um, so we so take them in carry on luggage from now on in. Yeah, don't trust Virgin. Um, so we run my. I bring a mic. Did you get that? Was that insured? Did you get those? No, nah, they they're not insured for accidents apparently. So, yeah. That's. Fun. Yeah, that's fine. Tell me about it. Anyway, so I bring my own mic to every show because using other mics is really gross and yeah. you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, what sort of mic do you use? Mine's a... Oh, what's the one you have? It's the... Beta 58. Beta 58. That's yeah. the one. Cordless? No. I will get a wireless though. Yeah. You wait. Download. You wait. <laughs> I'm going to get a gold wireless mic. Um, Are so, you going to spray it gold? Yeah. Oh, okay. Or yeah. just get a gold one. I don't know if they have gold ones. 
Um, I'm, so I plug that into a splitter, and the splitter goes to our laptop, which um, you know is for my in ears, and then it goes to the front of house, so they can control my um, reverb and all that sort of effects and stuff. And in the session we have, I can control the amount of reverb I have, yep. so I can actually sing along to my own reverb rather than them making it. Yep. So it means I can vibe along to my stuff a lot easier. And you can adjust that yourself on your pack. Uh, my levels of my pack, but my reverb levels on the computer. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So it's 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 a pretty simple pretty setup, basic setup that you've that you've got. Uh, it used to be more full on because we controlled all the vocal effects through the session, yeah. and so we'd have to make them change and cut and everything in the song and stuff it was very hard. But the thing with that is that all those effects would go on my in-ears and sometimes they would overpower my voice. Uh, so I'd be pushing really hard to hear what I was doing while these delays are doing all this dumb shit. So yeah, it's it's a lot easier now. So it's a lot, you've got a lot less in your ears now. Yeah, yeah, so now I... Uh, what do you have in your ears? Can you tell us what you obviously yeah. a little bit of guitar? So now it's a lot of stage sound because my in-ears couldn't cope with the amount of distorted guitars we had. Yeah. So the cymbals pick up so much in a mic. Yeah. So it's just like all my ears were doing was like, and I just couldn't hear anything. My pitching was terrible. I was like, what this, what's going on? So what we did is we made sure uh, my mic's kind of a bit hot and it picks up stage sound and I get guitars, bass and samples and click yeah. as well, but kind of like a bit on the side. So my pitching is a lot easier to do. Yeah, but mainly vocal. Vocal would be what? Vocal's the main one. So it's vocals what, the loudest. What percentage would, would the vocals be? Probably in 60. 60% percent yeah, so. and everything else. Yeah. Fantastic. It's more important to hear yourself than anything else. Because yep. you know it's taking ear out if you have to. And yep. just have the foldbacks running. Yeah. Yeah. And you still have, you got you got your foldbacks running as well too. Depends on the show. Some don't have it. Because some, if the headline band don't want them, then I, yeah, there's nothing you can do. Yep. So we played at Enter Shikari. We played, they didn't have any foldbacks. So I had to boost everything up because I couldn't hear anything. As soon as you take it up, you know, there's nothing, nothing on stage. stage. No, and we didn't have cabs either. No, wow. yeah, so it was all direct, so no no sound at all on wow. stage. And, okay, so ha tell us a little bit about that, about having fallback on the ground and then not having fallback. Well, not having it made me push and it made me actually, no, I didn't blow it up, but I definitely felt rough after. My voice was a bit gone because I could, I had to fight. So you actually, the fallbacks actually, as a rule, I, help I you I think cabs help the most. Yeah. Having cabs on, having stage sound is so important, I think, because you're able to hear a lot more, and even if you're struggling in your ears, you can take it out. And yeah. you can ask the dudes on the monitors to turn you up, or to turn other things up, just in case it's like a backup plan. But I reckon no stage sound, your ears has to be amazing, you know, like, to be able to cope with that, because it's all you have on stage is just drums. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it comes with practice, you know, as well. A good learning curve. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, That's I know for Europe, if there's no monitors on stage, I've got to, like, chill. I've got to turn my pack up, I've got to yeah. get away from the drums, and i got to make sure that everything in my in is a good level. Yeah. Otherwise, and, I'll blow out. And you're not trying to sing over the I'm top of everything. not trying to sing over everything, yeah. Yeah, very, very important. Fantastic. What was your songwriting process? Um, and do you come up with melodies or lyrics firstly? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think I come up with lyrics first. I think what I normally do is I go on my notes if I have any sort of um, any sort of idea or one line. I write the one line and then I write paragraphs. Just yep. paragraphs and paragraphs of lyrics. Yep. And then if I have a melody later on, I can just go through and pick and choose what I want yep. that fits. Because I think it's a lot easier to fit lyrics to a melody than melodies to a lyric. Yes. Because, you know, you, you're changing your melody for the amount of syllables that you have, yep. which I don't think is good. Yep. So I do it the other way and I kind of fit lyrics to work. If I don't like how they're placed, I can change little bits and pieces and it works a lot easier. Yeah, because I've seen you, I've gone through songs and we're going through, through them and how you kind of, we nearly sort of bend things or hold things out so we can make it fit within the melody yeah even though there probably wasn't as many syllables or consonants in there to fit it out you would just let it flow through let it go. Yeah. which uh, which i think was a really good good technique a, good, a great writing technique as well too so and so and and with that 
do, does the band come up with some music, Jacob, or, or do you go to the band with an idea and then you jam it out? What, what's the process that you start to put the actual song, the music together with it? Or do you write some of the music as well too? What, what's the... Um, our guitarist, Ethan, writes all the instrumentals, yep. pretty much. Um, everything, and he, yeah, he's crazy. He's crazy. <laughs> Sometimes he comes up with vocal melodies if he needs to, and he'll give them to me and I'll be like, wow, that's really hard. <laughs> so so does he does he come with music to you or yeah. do you go with your lyrics that you're messing around with to him and say, I've got this, can you write something around it? Oh, a bit of both. I'd both. say, yeah, a bit of both. Yeah. We're, we're pretty open with the way we write because we've been writing together for like, we've been writing together for maybe six years. Yeah. Um, and so he kind of, if he has an idea, he'll send it to me and then maybe he'll have a piano with like a little melody idea that he had for me and I can kind of chop and change it and make stuff to it or maybe I'll leave it like for the song The Haze he pretty much wrote that chorus and you're saying that he pushes you as well so he writes some crazy melodies for yeah, melodies. yeah he does because yeah. that one's crazy because he doesn't like he doesn't know the voice he doesn't know the voice <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like well here's all and it was just like these jumps are massive I'm like dude like this is sick but it's gonna be hard yeah <laughs> it's, it's just like oh, just do it man it's all good That's, are they queen watching the queen movie it looks like that they did that in the queen movie as well yeah. they all sort of pushed each other which is great as well too yeah, yeah. and I, I definitely sit there with him and he's got something i'll be like oh, i just do it you know maybe what about more like this and he'll be like yeah i'll try it and we did it he's like man that's hard and we'll be like yeah, that's, that's cool it. exactly same with drums same with bass i think everyone pushes each, pushes each other in the writing process your drummer's crazy he's really good isn't he we've had we've known Mater since we were young as well he was the only drummer who wasn't me in battle of the bands to drum so we got him on and he was really good and he's been he's got better and kicking better. goals since then yeah, yeah cool. his, his drumming's fantastic a uh, very very good drummer he nailed it on pool definitely yeah, it's his best drumming so far. Yeah, hundred percent. That's all I said. I said his drumming, his drumming is definitely improved yeah, for, sure. for sure. Definitely. Um, okay. Just another one. It's a very simple question, but I think it's a very good question here as well too. How do you come up with such great melodies? Oh, I don't. <laughs> um, I think making yourself very open to different genres is what will push you to have better ideas. Because you have uh, a lot of big jumps. Yeah, which are, which are big, big hooks. Which they seem to do all right, which is weird. Um, I, I think that's the, the best way I can describe making stuff like that is making sure you listen to literally anything but the genre you're playing. Yeah. If, so as soon as you only listen to your genre, you're going to be boxed in straight away. And you're going to have some run-ins with melodies you're happy with but melodies you know other people have already had yeah and i think as long as you keep your music knowledge big you'll you know you can take things as you go and see different ideas and see different ways to approach different melodies and stuff but um other than that i, I don't know it's you just make them up yeah pretty much yep. yeah yeah do you ever get on the piano and just make them yeah. on the piano yeah absolutely um i definitely do that a lot more than i would just Humming them. Sometimes I, sometimes I just freestyle stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I get up to the vocal booth thing or the, the mic or whatever and I just say, press record. Yes. Yeah. So let's see what happens. Let's have some fun with this. I think the best way to do vocals is to feel it. You've got to feel yeah. where you want to go, what you want to sound like. Good to hear the chords are being played exactly. though, so you know what notes you're going to be using within in the melody there. Exactly. It's very yeah. important to just freestyle. That's, that's fantastic. Okay. What is in the pipe works in 2020? I know that you're playing the Download Festival mm -hmm. and you're going to be touring nationally around Australia. Tell us a little bit about the Download Festival. How did you get asked to do that? Yeah. Through Unified or independently or through I management? Actually, I think our booking agent got it for us, which is sick. Yeah. He does it so much behind the scenes work with us and stuff. But um, yeah, we got Download and we were stoked. You know, it's a big, huge festival for us. Do you know what stage you're playing on already this early? Nah, they, they say you get this stage, but they don't. Like, they say you get a certain stage, but then they won't actually tell you until closer to the date when they sort out the, the lineup for the day and all that sort of stuff. So I actually, I don't really know. I've also never been before. So yeah. I don't know what to expect. There's a couple, so there's two dual stages. So look out for Jacob very early playing, probably the main stage. I would love that. <laughs> That'd be great. I think it would be. Then again, the 10th stage would be sick too, because you yeah. get good sound. You yeah. get a good sound quality in there. So. Yeah. Fantastic. 
touring, anything else planned? Um, so far nothing really planned but Europe and download. Um, we'll be touring around Australia I'm guessing, yep. of course, as usual. Um, we'll be doing some headline stuff but um, so far I think we're just thinking about writing. Yep. You know, something to do, album two. Now, now what about America? Have you got much interest in, in, in America? We did and we do but so far um, nothing's really lined up perfectly to for us yet. Yeah, no, nothing yet that really was going to be great. So, you know, it might still happen. Yep. Alright, we're going to whip through these now. Your career as as a singer, what's what's been the highlight so so far? Um, probably learning how to scream. That didn't hurt. Yep. You know, like figuring that out was like I remember messaging you a hundred times, being like, "Oh, I've, I've done it." I think. Yes. <laughs> and it was uh, it was an eye opener to my own voice, you know, because it's a different, totally different to anything I thought singing was. Yep. You know, not using power, using technique, and that was like such a foreign concept to me and then learning that made learning singing a lot easier yep and just being like okay technique over power yeah that's how you go into singing i think the biggest thing is a metal especially singer, touring especially. as well exactly too. touring and being a metal vocalist <coughs> pretending on stage that it's power and not technique is like what you do yep. you know you pretend that these notes are killing you but really you're thinking so hard about how to get to these places and it's just, yeah. it's just how it is. So it's not as easy as what it looks guys. <laughs> no, it's a lot harder. Jacob, what is the one piece of advice, advice that you would give a budding up and coming singer? Uh, I give vocal lessons. Yep. Definitely, straight away. And just keep practicing. Like, I think that was a foreign concept to me for a long time. I was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get good at some point, it'll just happen at a show. But no, I just practice, practice like every day. Like that's how you do it. Yeah, and being open-minded and I think self-aware as well too. Feeling what's going on, trying different things. Exactly. Tightening less, more breathing. Placement of sound is very important within the head. Soft palate, hard palate, um, lower front teeth. Okay, let's let's do the run, run to the line here. Your favorite singer. Oh, my favorite singer, oh, Jeff Buckley. Your favourite song? Oh, I'm going to say Feel Good Ink, Gorillaz. Your favourite album that you would take on to a deserted island and it can't be a best of or a live album? Oh, Grace, Jeff Buckley. It's a dark album to listen to all the way through. Hell yeah. I get through that, I get two thirds away through that and I need to listen to some Beatles <laughs> to make me happy. <clears throat> Your favourite song that you enjoy singing the most? The mm -hmm. Haze. The Haze? It's just interesting, it's fun for a vocalist because it's a lot of falsetto, it's a lot of pretty stuff. Yeah. There's no hard singing in any of that. Well, not, not, I mean like there's no heavy screaming or anything like that, it's just yep. a fun song. Fantastic. It's our sound check song. Fantastic. Um, the most memorable show or performance that you have witnessed? As in I've been to? Exactly, as a punter. Hans Zimmer yep. at uh, Rod Laver Arena, it was amazing. Wow. So good. Fantastic, why? Because they were just so many amazing, in you know, like uh, amazing musicians all in one group. Yep. But they all had time to shine at different places. Like no one was fighting each other, and it was just incredible to watch. You know? Fantastic. Mm. Most memorable show or performance that you have done in Thornhill? I'm gonna say Sydney on the Dark Pool tour. Wow, it was insane. Right. That's so just just gone. Yeah, that just happened. Yeah, it yep. was only a couple of weeks ago. Why? Um, people were just so loud and so incredibly feisty. You know, people were just moving around, jumping around, people getting on stage, jumping off. It was just like such a good show. I remember one of the first times that you came in to a singing lesson and you said that someone was mouthing the lyrics back to one of your songs mm. and it was a big moment it for was, you. Yeah, and then you go to shows like that and it's just like, they're so loud, so yeah. overpowering. Yeah. I wouldn't even have to sing, you know, they just songs. Sing it. Yeah. That's great. That's so sick. Fantastic. <laughs> That's exciting. Do you have an idol? Yeah, Ollie Sykes. Ollie Sykes. Bring me the horizon. Bring me the horizon. What a man. Have you met, personally met him? No. No? Maybe in the future. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, sure. maybe he'll support you guys one day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? 
Oh, here we go, here's another one. If you could have a dinner party invite two famous people, dead or alive, who would they be? Mm -hmm. I threw in dead or alive then. <laughs> I was gonna say, um, let's say Freddie Mercury, because that'd be sick. Yeah. He'd be a cool guy. And Jeff Buckley. Yeah, Jeff Buckley. Oh. What a, what a, what a dinner party. <laughs> I, was, I don't want him to talk, I just want him to sing the whole time. Yeah, yeah, be a lot of booze going down there as well too. And do you have a celebrity crush? Yeah. Not really. No? Mm. Okay. Your favourite leisure activity or hobby besides singing and songwriting? <clears throat> Playing video games. Cool. Do you have a favourite video game? Right now it's Modern Warfare. Cool. Do you have a personal motto that you live by? And if so, what is it? Um, yeah, actually. It's for my anxiety, which is anything that will be has already been. Yeah. So there's no point being stressed about it. Yeah. It'll, it's already happened. Fantastic. In, in other worlds. So just get through it. Yeah. You're fine. Excellent. Fantastic. Your fondest and best memory just in life um, besides being born? I don't even think I remember that. Um, I reckon I was getting my first guitar. Yeah. What sort of guitar was oh, it? Some really bad one. It was like a lion. I <laughs> it came with a little amp. And I remember I, I cried all through Christmas and I just played Smoke on the Water and it was dun, amazing. Dun, 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 dun. Actually, I might have even played something worse than that, like I wouldn't even know. Your biggest life-changing moment? Ooh, probably the dark pool. Why? Because we didn't expect for it to be the way it was. We didn't expect As to have the sound or the success? The success. The sound was like... We, we've been writing it the whole time, so we know what was going on and what we wanted to sound like, but the success was insane. Fantastic, but you've worked hard, Jake, and you deserve yeah. the success that you've got. You Thank did, you. You're making, you're making waves uh, on, on the Butterfly EP. You know, people were talking about you then. You know, people were asking me about you. Mm. So, um, you deserve all the success that, that you get. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> Do you have a, a most embarrassing moment? On stage for sure. <laughs> Let's go with this one. Yeah, I remember the first time UNFD came to watch us to scout us. Um, I was singing with the mic, and I tripped on the mic lead, pulled the mic out, stopped, and I was still singing in it with no sound, and then I dropped the mic. And then I had to get it back and put Plug it in. back in, and then it made heaps of feedback, and then I had to keep singing. It was so bad. And they still put us on. The label. <laughs> the whole thing is, 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 not really, is they're looking for a diamond in the rough. They don't care about a mistake like that. That Because it happens to anyone, you know. They're looking at the bigger picture. They're looking at long game as well, two, three, mm -hmm. four, five albums down the track, whether you guys have got what it takes. Mm -hmm. Not about dropping a microphone. Like, we're nearly there. <clears throat> what would you do if you had one year to live? Same thing. Wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Guys, do that, okay? <laughs> if you had one week to live, yeah. same thing. Probably, yeah. Fantastic. Mate, that pretty much wraps up. Do you want to leave the viewers with anything, Jacob? Um, keep singing. Keep singing, keep rock have rock. fun. Absolutely. Make sure that you're um, chasing your dreams and being happy doing what you're doing because life is way too short. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. Thanks for coming in, mate. I really appreciate it. That was fantastic. Um, I really, really do appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Peace and love. Be good to each other. Out. Okay. So what do you want to go over here today? Because I've got all of your scales that we've, that we've, uh, that we've done. Um, two things I wanted to sort is I wanted to go over just my warm-ups that I was doing just to zone in and make sure I'm not overwarming up because sometimes I feel like I am overwarming up and especially with um, opening shows in Europe because I know I'm going to have to do a little warm up for sound check yep. that I'm going to have to go on later and I wanted to know how much less warming up I should be doing for the actual show because I've already pre-warmed up and sung, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I, I felt at Chicago, because that was the first show we opened so just keep on going. I'm just going to open this door up here because I've locked this door <coughs> so no one comes in. Um, yeah, as the first show we've opened in a while, so I kind of forgot. Um, and then I also wanted to work a bit on my pitching. Alright, cool. So, 
Now, with warming up, so make sure that when, when you're warming up before the sound check, yeah. go through your standard warm up. We're going to go through that today. Yeah, I did three arms um, and I did one or two um, wee falsettos and then I'd sing. Yep. And I felt fine doing that. But you, then I'd redo my whole thing before I play, which is probably overworking it. You want to you wanna be just warmed up. Okay, that's what you want to do. You basically just want to get your levels, like you see a lot of bands, they don't go too hard in sound check yeah. as well too. You just want to basically get your stuff done. I know that a lot of bigger bands, the lead singers don't even do do their, do their sound. I wouldn't if I could. Yeah, they, they don't do their sound check. They have the sound uh, engineer that's already got all their levels already ready. They go through and go and all, all, do all their stuff as well too. So. Um, we might sort of do definitely do that in the, in the future. Um, <clears throat> so go through go through as much as you think that you need to be just warmed up before your your sound check. Okay, if you're coming off doing sound check, try to again try to just have a flask yeah. with room temperature to, to very warm water in in there or whatever or whatever you want in there. I have like some lemon in there as well too. And, yeah. a vi and a vitamin drink as well. So I have, t I have tea in here yep. uh, as well too, in a smaller one. But keep your vocal cords warm by having warm fluids. Don't have any cold fluids um, at all. So that's one thing that's going to be easy for you to keep your voice warm. Yeah. Um, Should I well. warm down after that or just stay like that? I, I like to warm down. That's just me because you have lactic acid in your body okay so if you work any muscle a lot it will have lactic acid I'm talking a lot though so if you haven't done a lot of vocal work you won't you won't have a lot of lactic acid in your vocal cords. You normally just do like one song one or two songs yeah I if you're feeling okay I, I probably would just do a, a real quick couple of sirens on the ung start low um, I will do probably four or five of those right. when you finish your sound check. Yep. And be, then re-warm up how I normally would or only half? Again, to how you feel, yeah. okay? But generally, you've you got to think that you're the same as, as, as a football player. So if we, we were a soccer player, we stretched our hamstrings because we had a little bit of a run uh, an hour before the show, Right before the show, we have to go and do it again as, as, as well too. You'll see a lot of guitarists as well, too. I'm not quite sure about your guitar. But you'll see a lot of guitarists warming up for an hour and a half, two hours before a show. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also, I'm not quite sure whether, you've, whether you watch the, the, the football or the grand final, but they'll actually look at the grand final team two hours beforehand, and they'll be in their shorts limbering up lightly to it. I'm not saying do that as a vocalist, but you want to be fully warmed up when you get to get on stage. But you want to be just warmed up, Jacob, because you got to think that not only do you want to make it through the show really well and and not hold back and give give it do the best vocal performance you can. Yeah. We want to also long long game. We need to go and 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 have think about where we're going to be finishing as well too, finishing mm -hmm. the tour. So I'll just sh I'll just show you a photo um, here. Jake. Come over here, mate. <laughs> this is Airborne's tour of Europe. Mm, my God. There's a lot of, all you see is there's a lot of Tuesdays there. Mm. And they're playing a lot of gigs in a row, man. That's crazy. How are they so um, you, you know, again, we'll go over that if you're on if you're on a, a like a, a pretty crazy tour like that. Yeah, this one's pretty easy. So I I seen um, you know I seen North Lanes tour, and and they're doing a rural tour which is mm. full on. Yeah. You know, but they they toured like North America and stuff like that, and it was quite quite rigorous what they were doing there. Yeah. So, um, and the year before that, I know that um, did you see? 
uh, in Hearts Wake. To, to, to yeah, their one was nuts. Insane. We played some of the shows on that. Yeah. So and just watching them still be really good was like crazy. Don't know how they did that. But that's what you want to do. You, you always want to be just warmed up when you get up on stage as well too. A lot of bands as well too don't have as a hard song to start with, so it kind of just sort of Easy way to it eases their way into it. Vo not a vocally challenging song. You look at all Queen's opening sets and it's, it's, it's they're never going to start with Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. or um, Don't Stop Me Now or something like that. So. Um, so sa same with you. Um, so just when you warm up before you get up on stage, you might only need to do your ungs once or twice. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. After and a warm up, uh, after like sound check, maybe I only have to do the ungs once and we falsetto once, and then just focus more on cries and stuff. With the ungs as well too, you gotta also think you can do the ungs as little or as least as you want. You know, they're not gonna wear your voice out. You can do ungs for, you know, half an hour. Yeah. Um, they're not going to do much. They're, not gonna, they're going to warm your voice up, but they're not going to wear it out. Should I be doing the ung sirens? Because with the ungs, we were doing is the ung. Um, you can do you can do whatever you want. If you haven't got headphones, yeah, you can do, do some ungs. If you're setting up your gear on the side of the stage. Yeah, I might do ung sirens when I'm setting up my gear. That sounds good. Yeah. Because I also do. And stuff like that, which is. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that because it pushes a lot of air through. I know yeah. we've spoken about that before, yeah. do burbles. Um, but yeah, when I'm on the way to classes, I'm always doing. Uh, I start as low as I can. Um, it's about 80% of the way up my range. And then I go, the next one I go to about 82. Um, go up and down like that yeah. and I stick with that I do that for probably 10 to 20 minutes in the car on the way to lessons uh, and then I do some wee falsettos and that's it because with my posture I can't do my cries properly if if I don't have my posture straight yeah. so that's that's kind of that's kind of it for me there um, I did I don't do much more with with that there that's that's as much as, as what I do then when I get in and I do some cries yeah, whatever when, up. when I'm standing up I go I go and do what I what I go and do so does that answer that question there yeah. yeah do you want to go over your warm-up here now but really Jake your warm-up is up to you you yeah, feel exactly. yeah how I'm feeling yeah. Jake as well too, one thing that we didn't ask in the interview there as well too is um, do you sing any of your songs before you go up on stage? Maybe. Yeah. Just to test if I'm warm up, warmed up sometimes. Like when I'm side of stage maybe I'll do a chorus yeah. of the first track which is normally it's views from the sun that we open with yeah. and that chorus is like, it's like that. It's like, take what you need and don't ever give me nothing as the sun goes down. So normally I do like, as the sun, and I just really try and get there. I would highly recommend doing your opening verse and chorus, Jacob, 100%, just to see that you're warmed up. Yeah, and you it's know, a good feel. You know what you're going to, so it's a good, good to feel that. It's like a footy play. They kick the ball and they... Have you seen them before they go up, go out on the field on the ground? They like they tackle and they're doing all their stuff. Yeah. Like, so I would always be doing that just to see how you go. Oh yeah, no, it's not feeling great. Let's do a couple more wee falsettos or a couple more cries or whatever it is to get yeah. it going there. Yeah. That's what you'd probably probably need to do. So just just to feel what you're doing there. Do you want to go over your warm ups now, Jacob, or do you want to go into some pitching? Yeah, some pitching would be nice. All I right. think I'm pretty good with my warm ups. Yeah, cool. Um, Jacob, breathing. Do you still, do you go over your breathing? Um, yeah, but like my breathing was normally pretty good from choir. Let's just revise your breathing, Jake. I want to see because that does all your support. So jump on the jump on the ball for us there if you can. So make sure it goes right in the V of the ribs. That's it. Yep. I'm going to see it's in the right place here, Jake, okay? Just roll up a bit, man. 
Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's where it's got to be, right in the V there. Breathing out all your air. Just feeling the heartbeat and the pulse. Do you feel the heartbeat and the pulse? Yeah. Excellent. Let's breathe it right out. For 10 to 30 seconds, so whenever you want to stand up, we can stand up. Okay, and your hand in your stomach, hand in your chest. That's it. We want to do dual breathing, 80, 10 in one breath. That was a little bit too top, too much up top. I want, that's it, yeah. So 80% down here, 10% just through the bronchial tube. That's good. Good work. Good. Now on these last two, Jake, we're going to tighten up, breathe it in, and tighten, breathe it out. Good, you should feel some pressure when you tighten there, breathe it in and tighten. Good, did you feel the pressure there when you tighten? This is really important to do when you're doing the high stuff yeah. and um, uh, you, you're screaming stuff or any harder stuff. Yeah, screaming stuff. When I started, I was using off shoulders. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, yeah. super important that this, this does that. Jake, you have a size three basketball at home, don't yeah, you? Do. Yeah, I would probably recommend to jump on it a couple of times a week. Yeah, just to get this activated. I like to get a little bit more air down there. That's, that, that, that's like what I, what I want to get happening there. Okay, let's see how your pitching is going, okay? Mm, not great. Okay, let's see how it's going. Single notes on the chord, Jake, just on one, any voice. One. Okay. One. Your turn. So an octave we're sometimes one sliding through there. Okay, let's do the fifth note of the chord, Jacob. So five. So top note. slide again, a full octave you did. Five. That was the root, that's the fifth. Five. Good joke, just, just with, you have a one, you have a one, three, one, five, one, yeah, eight, yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> Very important scale for you, Jacob, that, that one there. Also octave with numbers, please do that one. Jake, do you have a one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four, interval scale. I'd probably like to give that to you as well too. And Jake, how many groups of pitching like this do you do you have? Not too many. Like a recording like this, it's called rudimentary pitching. I've got here that I recorded a, a, a couple. Which, what sort of ones are they? It's just exactly this, it's exactly this. this no, I've never done this. All right, I'm gonna record some of these off for you. Not, not yet, dude, because it's going to get, this is just going to get harder as well, so let's do five ones, okay? Five one, five one, your 
What's your turn, Jake? Good. Arpeggio one three five eight. Hear me. One three five eight. One three. One three five eight. One three five eight. One three five eight. One three five eight. Reverse it. But good. Oh man, that's hard. Eight five three one. Eight five three shit. Eight five three one. All right, let's do a couple of octaves, Jacob. Just straight one eight, so this should be pretty easy. One eight. chord with some more noise, 1-8 one still. 1-8 one Wait, shit. 1-8 one 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 Shit, try that again. 1-8 Jake, whenever I play an octave, I always play the chord and the top note separately. My fingers are big enough, I can play the whole but I play it for you guys. Right. It's like looking at the top of the mountain before you climb it. Gotcha. Let's reverse it. Eight one. Eight one. Eight one. Eight one. Eight one. Eight one. Alrighty. Cool. I'm going to run a set of these off, Jake. That's hard. What, I'm, what, what you're going to need, though, Jake, is with these, is that in another week, you're going to need another... You need five of these. 
mm. to put them in a circulation. Because this recording, you're going to learn this like a malady in about a week or so once you do this every day. True. This is going to challenge your ear for the next week. After that, it's not going to challenge it as much. Oh, really? Because you get in the sink of You've got to learn it. Yeah. You need four or five of these to put them in the circulation. Do one one day, one the next to keep you challenged as well too. Can I have your phone? I'm gonna run I'm gonna run this off for you. <clears throat> okay Jacob, this is your first group of what we call rudimentary pitching. Um, you want to have four or five of these in the future and just put them in the circulation. <clears throat> okay. Root note on the chord, just on the one. 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 Straight in, Jake. Try to... Grace the notes, don't slide too much. Fifth note of the chord, Jake, top note of the chord. Five. Five, top note of the chord, Jake. Jake from here, five one. Five one. Five one. Hear the chord. Try to be precise. Reverse that, Jake. One five. One five. One five. <laughs> Try it up, Jake. One, three, five. One, three, five. Jacob, we're going to do the arpeggio now. One, three, five, eight. One, three, five, eight. Strike all the notes, Jacob. One, three, five, eight. Let's reverse it here, Jake. Arpeggio coming down. Eight, five, three, one. Eight, five, three, one. Try to strike all the notes, Jacob. Let's do a couple of octaves now. One eight. One eight. One eight. Reverse 
said Jacob, 8-1. 8-1. Jake, that's your save that five minutes of pitching there. For him, sorry mate, I'm just running a little bit late, mate. Right. Jake, I really quickly want to give you this scale now. <clears throat> one, three, one, five, one, eight, one's important for you. Oh, I've got that one. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay, cool. I want to give you a smaller version of that. <clears throat> okay, I gave you big jumps because you use a lot of big jumps. Hear me? <laughs> Jazz. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. Good, let's keep it going. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. By yourself, Jacob. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. Good. Watch your two, Jake. Watch your first four going up as well. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. Yeah, watch your four. A little bit underneath your fours, Jake. Watch your twos as well. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. You're trying to sit over the top of these notes. We're nearly sort of waiting, coming underneath. Okay. One, two. Jake, this exercise is a root, second, third, fourth, fifth, and fourth scale. Have a listen to me. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. Keep it going, Jake. Focus on your fours, man. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, four. 
Beautiful. Yeah, that's going to help a lot. Right. Yeah, I reckon in the future maybe, you know, maybe coming in for maybe another lesson or two just to do some more pitching. Yeah, I'll do some after you get back. To focus on some pitching. Or download, be nice. But yeah, just focus on that. You've got a lot of really good scales, especially the 1315181 yeah. octave with numbers. Jumps true voice to falsetto as well too. No, I'll be smashing those ones out before I get them. Sick. Thank you very much for having me. Nah, man. Thank you for coming down, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, hope the I really do. Podcast works out. Cheers. Gonna be a lot of editing. <laughs>